Uh, let's see, can you guys hear me without the microphone? Yeah. All right, because I like to uh, maybe stand up here a little closer to you and uh, not hide behind the podium either. Um, one thing I want to point out here real quick, you're probably wondering what the Engineering 281 is. <laughs> That's a number I actually uh, am also the uh, chairman of the Education Council for the Genesis 3 Design Group, uh, which is an educational uh, group for the swimming pool industry. Pool, spas, and water features, we actually cover all of it. And uh, we have all of these classes, actually 124 different programs that we do. Uh, in, a, in a catalog, if you're interested, uh, there, if you really want to get into water, uh, we have you know, design courses, uh, architectural tech courses, uh, engineering and construction related programs, and uh, also some business related programs for the pool and spa industry and uh, water features. So the 281 really just, uh, like a university, organizes this particular program into a, a group with other ones. that stuff. Um, I wanted to, this is just a real simple uh, schematic diagram of a really basic water feature. Actually, this has never been built, but I use it for uh, just explaining some really basic concepts. I think a lot of you are uh, dealing with different aspects of uh, preservation, conservation, and you're not really maybe familiar with the terminology that we might use for the actual mechanical system. So, I just wanted to point out a few things here. Uh, starting with the lower pond, that might be you know, the lower basin of a multi-tiered water feature or something like that. Uh, in there, we've got a, a pair of suction outlets. I'm gonna talk about some safety issues related to that here shortly. We've got some pipes that bring the water over to the pump, and the pump pushes the water through the filter and recirculates it back up to the upper pond. And this just has a really basic spillway. It's kind of like uh, some of the features that we saw yesterday, uh, maybe that one at the University of Texas where they have the, the staining on the, the big wall. There's just an upper pond and it spills into a lower pond. Uh, but this, you know, schematically could represent lots of different water features. In this particular case, the, uh, there's just one pump and that pump is filtering the water and sending it up to the top. So the, the visual thing that you see, whatever the spillway might be, is also part of the primary filtration system. That's not always done that way. We'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, where you have multiple features, you may want to split off your filtration system from your feature pumps. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, one thing I want to focus on right now is really these two suction outlets right here. There's a big, uh, safety issue with these and that is uh, what we call entrapment and the problem is is that those pumps can be very powerful and can actually hold your body down onto the, the floor of the, the, the body of water uh, it can pull a limb into a pipe and so people have died people have drowned or uh, been eviscerated and other you know problems with these drains. So there's actually some laws now. Um, uh, we've had rules in the industry for a long time, uh, and some states were a lot more proactive with it. Uh, it got to the point where some states were pretty lax. So when the problems continued, the uh, federal government stepped in with the Virginia Graham Baker Act. This was passed into law uh, probably about five years ago now. Uh, Baker is actually uh, related to uh, our, the Secretary of State, James Baker. This is his daughter, uh, Virginia Graham Baker. Uh, actually, this was his granddaughter, I think, was the one that actually died. Uh, she was held down at the bottom of a pool. and. Uh, Despite all the previous deaths that had occurred, this one happened to occur with such a high profile you know, figure in, in America that we were able to do something about it. So this Virginia Graham Baker Act passed and, and really set up a, a series of rules for people to follow to make things safe. And there's some different codes. I'm not going to get into too much detail about them. But what's happened now is that the 
the Virginia Grant Baker Act is now trickled down into the building codes so that as you're building anything with water that's got pumps, you're now bound to uh, these, these new rules to make things safe. A couple of the rules. The, the most important one is that for all new construction, you need to have two split drains. And the reason for that is that if you lay your body down on one of them, the other drain can handle 100% of the flow. In other words, you're not going to be held down and pinned down by the backing pressure of that pump. Imagine if you just had a single suction outlet and you've got this pump you know, pulling down really hard. If you lay your body down, you, you probably won't get up. There are tricks to it. You can get up. Go ahead. You got a question? No. Okay. By the way, I encourage questions as I'm going. I, I don't need to wait till the end. So just, you know, if you got something, uh, go ahead and raise your hand at any time. But the idea here is that uh, where you have the T, you, you maintain your line sizes, and there are rules about what the line sizes should be. And you, you maintain at least a three foot clearance between these drains because the human body, at least 99% of the average uh, human adult, I guess, would not be able to bridge their body across two drains separated by three feet, right? So the idea is that, you know, if you lay down on one, the other side can handle 100% of the flow without very much restriction at all. So, you know, it handles so much flow that you could just roll right off or push right off. In fact, the, uh, the force that, that you're limited to in terms of pushing off is, uh, is 15 pounds. That 15 pound force actually came from some studies in Europe uh, regarding the panic hardware on doors. And they wanted to make sure that children could get out of a burning building. And so 15 pounds was after they did these studies, that was the force determined you know, the, that you needed to be able to push a door with no more than 15 pounds. So uh, they just took that same rule and applied it here in this, uh, in this standard. Uh, there's also some other rules about the depth of the pipes and things like that. And the reason why I'm bringing this up for this uh, program is that a lot of historic features do not have these split suction outlets. They have maybe just a single drain somewhere. So when it comes time to do these, these renovation projects, uh, it's important to look at, at these code issues and make sure that we're bringing it up to, up to the new standards and you know, to prevent any, any problems. We, we just had a, a project, actually we're still working on it, in, uh, in LA where they had single suction outlets and they were so big, actually they weren't very big in plan, they were only about 30 inches by 30 inches, but they were about six feet deep. And the first time I went out there to look at this project, I thought, well, what happens if you fall in head first into that thing? There's not even enough room to turn your body around to get out, so you're, you're gone, you're, you're just done. And the interesting thing about that project was that they actually had these big stainless steel baskets that were required to be lifted out for maintenance. And I thought, you know, all someone has to do is lift that out and slip head first and they won't get out. So there's a lot of little things to think about in terms of safety. And this was a, an old uh, water feature that had been done back in the 60s. And uh, we, they've already demoed out that, that problem and, and we've got it solved with our new design. But these are the kind of things that uh, are, are really important from a safety standpoint. Yeah? Does water depth matter at all? I mean, if you have a shallow pool, are you still required to have the same two drains? Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, this isn't in the code, but it's in my company's policy, is that if it's in a, a shallow body, like shallower than 18 inches, we actually split it twice. In other words, we would have four drains. Um, and the reason why I put that rule in place for us is that I've seen my own kids at the, the local uh, club where they've got a real shallow pool and the kids, it's like they use the drains like part of a game or something. It's like, hey Johnny, you know, you go stand on that one and you stand on that one. Well, you know, if two people laid on this, they, they could get pinned down. The code wasn't meant to prevent 
you know, multiple people from laying down. It was just really to prevent, you know, a single person. The chances of two people going and laying down on a drain are, are pretty remote. Yeah. And what is the distance um, between the trains, the minimum distance? It's, it's actually three feet, and you'll see it, I, I, in this drawing it says 36 inch minimum, 72 inch maximum. Um, actually, there's a couple different codes. One of them says 36 inch center to center on the pipes. The problem is, is the other code doesn't say center to center, so if there was ever a legal problem, the attorneys might bring that version out and argue that it was supposed to be 36 inch clear. So I just avoid that whole issue and just say, hey, it's 36 inch clear. The 72 inch max, actually, this is just in our detail. The reason that I have that in there is that if you put the drains really, really far apart, you'll have more head loss in the lines, more friction, and that will actually create a higher hold down force in the, in the drain that's blocked. So actually having them too far apart can also be a problem because there's more head loss and that creates a pressure differential, which is your hold down force. We're, some of us are used to working on historic buildings and um, their issues with code compliancy. And there's a requirement on many projects that when a restoration project uh, takes place that you're required to bring the building up to code with regard to fire sprinklers and life safety. Is, is there a requirement? I, when you talked about it, it didn't sound as though... There is. Um, and actually, the requirements came in in a couple different levels. There was one uh, really critical one, which is that there was a hard date where, the, where every commercial project was required to have code-compliant drain covers. And when they set that deadline, it was only about 18 months out from when they passed the law. And the problem was is that there wasn't a single drain that had actually been approved to, this, to the other standard. This, there's another, uh, uh, it's now an ANSI standard, but at the time it was an ASME uh, standard for the actual testing of the drain covers. And, and there were no drains available at the time, so it was like, you know, the whole industry was scrambling to figure out what to do. Um, that, that deadline actually slid a little bit. And uh, lots of products did get approved, and then there was a big push with all the hotels and you know, commercial projects to get drain covers on. But, but the drain cover is only one piece of that puzzle, uh, because if the plumbing isn't done right, the drain cover isn't going to solve every problem. It might solve certain types of entrapment. There's five different types, and it might solve one or two types, but not all five. So. If there's, there are some workarounds for the single drain uh, problem, if there was no way to get, you know, split drains, there, there are some other solutions. I don't recommend any of them. Um, probably the most common one is to put in what's called an SVRS, which is a suction vacuum relief system. But that's a mechanical device back at the equipment area that uh, is supposed to sense when there's an entrapment and then it shuts down the pump or opens up the pipe to break the vacuum. The problem with that is that it's an electromechanical device and all devices eventually fail. So at some point you run the risk of, you know, the, the, the one safety device actually not working when you need it. So uh, I'm not a big fan of those, um, but uh, we have used them. I mean, sometimes there's just no other solution to it. So uh, a couple things. Uh, these covers and the, and the pipes and the, the whole configuration is really designed for a, a specific flow rating and the covers are approved for, for specific flow ratings. Those ratings are actually printed on the molded uh, covers. If you're doing custom covers, then there's a kind of another set of rules that you follow. But one of the things when you start dealing with multiple pumps is if you have multiple pumps pulling from under the same covers, you have to add the, the total flow rate of all the pumps together and size the systems for that flow rate. Um, you, you don't just go by the largest pump or whatever. You have to assume that every pump is running and you have to design for the worst case scenario. Um, any questions on the, on the suction outlets? Oh, what's the status of trench drains? Those, uh, we, we're using a ton of them. 
um, the the issue with the trench strains is that they've. Are you talking about the smaller molded ones or the or the bigger custom made ones? Uh, okay. The the problem with some of the the channel drains, the, the molded ones, was that at least one company had some problems with their testing, and so really the the numbers that they were publishing uh, for their flow ratings were not accurate, and so they had to go back and retest and that actually lowered the ratings. There are other companies that didn't have that problem um, and we've always spec the other company. I, I wrote an article probably five years ago about the testing problem and predicted that they were going to have the big recall that they did about two years ago. Um, and the, the problem was is that there, there, there's a standard that the companies were testing all these covers to and there were just some loopholes in there. So. I, I did write this article and I said, hey, you know, we're going to have problems because there's too many ways to work around this. And um, one of the companies exploited that, actually, and made a lot of money doing it. And uh, I think last I heard they, well, they probably made about $100 million because of the issue, but I heard that they lost about 15 in the recall. Uh, so there were several covers that were actually recalled. So here the industry is running out trying to replace all these pieces and get everything compliant, and then it's like, whoa, you know, take it all out and <laughs> start all over. Uh, so the, the industry's had, had some issues, but uh, I think they've been solved now, and the ratings that are published are, are good, and the testing has been cleaned up. Um, as far as the bigger channels go, like for larger commercial pools where we're doing, uh, like fiberglass grading is the covers, that process really hasn't changed. Those covers need to be approved by a, a licensed engineer, and, and uh, those products really haven't haven't changed, and I haven't had any issues with, with that stuff. So, um, want to kind of run through some other devices here and, and how they might apply to these uh, fountain renovation projects. Um, in that diagram, I didn't have a have a skimmer in there, but uh, wanted to show you one. This is a, a product made by Crystal Fountains. It's actually a really compact uh, skimmer. It doesn't handle a whole lot of flow, but it's designed to fit within a thin wall. And, I, and on some of these features where we have you know, thin walls with small basins raised above grade, uh, you certainly don't want to have a big bump out for a traditional pool skimmer. But skimming is actually really good for the water. Um, all your debris basically enters at the surface, even if it was a dirty guy taking a bath in the, in the fountain as he enters, you know, really the dirt is, is hitting at, at the surface. Um, and as leaves are falling, they're hitting the surface. And if you can get that stuff skinned off before it gets soggy and sinks to the floor and then just sits there, uh, you can actually keep the, the systems a lot cleaner. So on some of our projects where we've renovated old uh, fountains, we've actually added skimmers into the walls to try to draw off some of that debris before it gets in there. It's not going to work for every project. There are jobs where you know, the materials and the configurations just aren't going to allow for it. But you know, there are solutions to make the systems a little bit more maintenance free um, by getting the debris off at the surface. Uh, piping, uh, plumbing materials, there's, uh, on, the, on these old systems I see a lot of cast iron, uh, a little bit of steel, uh, and a lot of copper. And the problem with all three of those is that they tend to foul up a lot more. Um, they rust. You know, the cast iron, I mean, it, it's, you know, like, like arteries or something. They just you know, keep closing in until they just don't flow anymore. Um, copper also has the problem of having uh, wear on it. Copper pipe is actually a pretty soft material and the, the flow rate that you can push water through copper pipe is actually less than you can do with even PVC because of the erosion of the pipe. In fact, with PVC you can, you can move water through it at easily 8 feet per second and not have a problem wearing out the pipe. But copper, uh, depending on the temperature, um, actually the max is five feet per second. That's, that's what the copper pipe industry says will, will prevent the wear. But 
at higher temperatures, that, that rating actually comes down even lower. So sometimes a copper pipe, you can't even run half of the flow rate that you can through an equivalent PVC pipe. You know, given two, you know, PVC and copper, the copper sometimes only handles half of the flow rate of your PVC. So what happens with uh, a lot of copper pipes is that the systems are just running too fast, it'll wear holes through it. So you go to pressure test the pipe and you find out that you've got a lot of leaks, uh, which of course would require a replacement. There's really no good fix for that. You can't just go in and line a pipe because if it's got holes in it, the lining type system is not going to work. Uh, PVC, it handles chemicals really well, so that, that's probably the, the primary pipe material choice for any new construction. And, you know, with flanges and things, you could certainly swap out, you know, existing uh, metal pipe for, for PVC pipe. Uh, it gets a little more challenging if you have exposed plumbing in a basin or something like that. You know, we saw some photos of those, uh, those details yesterday where we had uh, maybe, you know, bronze nozzles coming off of a header sitting right in the pond. You, you wouldn't want to do that in, in uh, PVC uh, without a lot of other details to really hold, hold the pipe down. But, you know, you could put concrete in a basin or something like that to encapsulate it. Uh, it doesn't like sunlight very much, so you want to have it UV protected. Polyethylene, uh, we, we had... Do you yeah. regularly spec, or is it pressure dependent? Schedule 40 or 80? Usually schedule 40. Um, sometimes schedule 80 just depends on the project, depends on the budget, because the schedule 80 can be twice as much depending on what you're doing. Uh, and I've heard of people having problems with schedule 80 too. But you know, really they're pretty flexible, and if you're designing the systems appropriately, you're not going to have problems even with the schedule 40. So if you if you have anything that might be exposed to the sun, I would definitely say go schedule 80 and then prime it paint it too, but, um, you know, things underground, I, I think Schedule 40 is fine, even if it's in a freeze-thaw area, as long as you've got, you know, your proper annual maintenance or, you know, draining or whatever you got to do. And what about the connections between PVC and polyethylene for, I've worked on trying to get small copper buttons and flexible copper up through a frog's mouth, and you know, I'd love to have gone to uh, plastic. Right, right. Yeah, you might have a better chance of doing it that with the polyethylene because it's a lot more flexible. One thing I like about polyethylene is that it, nothing likes to stick to it. It's almost like Teflon, and we've had projects where we've had like mineral spring water that would just calcify up and, and block any pipe, but with the uh, polyethylene, you could. You could just shut off the water for a day and let everything kind of dry out and everything just falls off the pipe and you turn on the water and it flushes it out and everything's clean again. So for those occasional projects where you've got really hard water, uh, polyethylene is actually better than even the PVC. So there was a question in the back. Yeah. Uh, what about stainless steel for new new pipe? I know it's expensive, but it's a small area. Yeah, and sometimes that's required for certain details, sure. it's. Uh, you know, we, we try to find ways to avoid getting into exotic stuff and, unless there's a budget or an absolute need for it. Uh, we can usually find ways to, to work around that. But, uh, you know, some, some projects do require stainless steel in, in certain areas of the project, but usually not all of it. You know, I mean, maybe the equipment area could be PVC and something that you see out at the feature might be stainless steel. One thing, uh, I think I have a slide on, on equipotential bonding later, which is really an electrical issue, but um, some fountains, uh, the old ones, don't have a, a dedicated bonding system, and, uh, and for safety purposes, the piping, metallic piping, might be their, their only actual bonding method. So, if you start taking that out and replacing with PVC, you may lose your, your bonding, equipotential bonding grid. What is that? You need to define that. Yeah, it, it's, uh, what it is is there's, if you've got water in a vessel, whether it's a water feature or a pool or whatever, 
you, you have the potential for having voltage differentials between the water and, and some surrounding metal or the, the ground or something. And that voltage potential is a shock hazard. And so you may touch the water and you become the conduit for discharging that electrical current and it could kill you. So what you do is you have the, the vessel has steel in it usually uh, for reinforced concrete stuff. Um, if it doesn't have steel, then you would have a bonding grid. It's really copper wire, like little number eight bare copper wire. Uh, around the around the feature and you have that linked with the same bare number eight copper back to the equipment and all the equipment is all linked up so what happens is everything in the system mechanically is all tied together with with these copper wires and it's it's like grounding but it's it's not grounding it's it's what we call bonding and the whole idea is that that copper wire will dissipate any voltage potential and eliminate the shock hazard. So if you have um, you know, stray currents from a motor or something like that, th those aren't going to travel over and, and build up at the pool until you become the, the release for that shock. So that, that's the, uh, the equipotential bonding. And, and the National Electric Code in Article 680 talks about, about this. There's a, uh, actually in 2008, it, it got expanded quite a bit. And uh, the, the rule that's been in place for a long time, though, it has been that every metal within five feet of the water needs to be bonded. So if you've got a, a water feature and you've got a wrought iron fence that's five feet away, that wrought iron fence needs to be tied electrically back to this bonding grid. If you've got a water feature and it's out in a lawn and there's no other metals around, you, you actually have to have a perimeter of this wire running around the feature in the ground to dissipate the energy, in addition to having a wire go back to the equipment area, wherever that is. So if you have the calder sitting in the pool, the calder has to be bonded. Calder better be bonded, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes? What's the law? Is it a the National Electric Code, NEC, Article 680, I may have a specific uh, section in Article 680 in a, in a later slide. Um, it's important for all these, you know, metal features though too. Even even the, the statuary, you know, bronze feature needs to be bonded for, for this uh, safety reason. So I have a little slide on that later. So just keep in mind, if you're taking out metal pipe, that may be the only bond on these older systems, so you need to think about how you're going to re-bond it. Um, I actually just threw this in this morning. Uh, wasn't something I thought about uh, before yesterday, but uh, the topic of theft prevention came up, and I was thinking about some things that we've done to, uh, to uh, in, in consideration of theft. One is that a lot of lights uh, in, in features, they, they have you know, these lights on bronze stands and, and there's just a cord that goes down into a conduit through the floor and there, there's usually there's a coil of this cord around the stand because by, by code, also Article 680, you need to be able to lift the light out of the water, uncoil the wire to, to change the, the actual light bulb in there. And the, the problem with these stands is that it's so easy to go grab one and cut the wire and run <laughs> and you've got pounds and pounds of uh, bronze that you can sell. And we've gotten away for the, from this for a long time, not, not only because of the theft, uh, but because I think they're unsightly, and we have better options. And, and the option that I prefer is that we actually have a niche built you know, into the floor, into the wall, and there are light fixtures made by the same company, and this is Hydrel, um, where the, the, the light can still tilt, and you still have some adjustability, you can rotate it and tilt it up to 30 degrees or something. But it's really locked into the floor and it needs special tools. You don't see the cords. It makes maintenance of the features a lot easier. And, uh, and no one's going to be able to just go in there and grab it and cut the cord and run. And you know, there's, I've seen features where you've got hundreds of these things out there. And you know, in an hour, somebody could make tens of thousands of dollars, I'm sure, uh, stealing these. 
Also, uh, kind of new technology, LED lighting. Uh, the, the colors are getting better. They, they're, they've got warmer colors now. Um, things aren't quite so blue. And the fixtures are getting really small. And they're, and they're so small that you don't even really need a rock guard on them anymore. The code says that if you've got something in the floor, you need a, a rock guard over it so somebody doesn't step on it and, and break the glass and, and have their foot go through it. But these uh, LED lights are getting so small, they, they fit in a two inch conduit or an inch and a half conduit. And you just don't need those, those big bronze uh, rock guards anymore. So, and they're easy, um, easier to install in, in renovations because you can pour through the walls and, and add these little lights as opposed to getting a jackhammer out and breaking large holes and dealing with all the reinforcement and stuff. So that's, a, that's another option that uh, you may want to consider. And then bronze nozzles, we, we actually did have a, a water feature up in the Bay Area that we did a few years back where uh, it required some renovation and we ended up putting the nozzles actually in concrete. It's sort of like that, uh, the Calder project where you raise the floor. We had the same thing, we didn't want to take the floor out but we needed to replumb it. And we came up with a, a detail and we used a, a certain nozzle from Crystal Fountains that can actually be in the uh, concrete itself. So uh, there was no chance of anybody stealing it, so I, I threw that in. By the way, the, uh, as you're talking about the bonding, I remember that because the last time before the renovation, all the washers and bolts that were holding the pylons in place were all corroding. We actually put in a nautic system underneath it as well, so that should take care of any open potential as well, I would think. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and things that are not bonded actually will rust a lot easier. Um, we do a lot of custom stainless steel covers and things, and, and uh, we had a there was a project in LA where the builder had put in probably a dozen of these stainless steel covers, and one of them, for whatever reason, was just rusting up far more, you know, the other ones weren't even rusting, but one of them was really rusting up, so they drained the pool and went and researched it and realized that the bonding wire had actually broken for that particular unit. It snapped off, and so they, they uh, cleaned it up and, and rebonded it, and I, I think it would be fine now. Um, let's see, moving down our schematic diagram, uh, pump technology. Uh, variable frequency drives have been around for decades, uh, but probably very few of them have really been used in, in these historic water features. The technology just wasn't available back when they were done. Uh, the advantage, what a variable frequency drive does is it, it takes the, the power uh, or the frequency of the power going to the motor and it, and it adjusts it so that the speed of the motor can vary. When you uh, when you plug in a pump into the wall, the standard frequency, that rotation, at, or not, well, the frequency is 60 hertz in the US. Uh, but the, the standard speed that that rotates at is uh, about 3,450 RPM. Uh, there are slower speeds, like a half, half of that. But for the most part, it's a fixed speed. And, and your pump performance is, is based on that speed. But with this technology, by varying the frequency going to the, the, the motor itself, you can speed the pump up, you can slow it down, and you can dial in the performance of that pump to match the hydraulic performance required for the project. The first thing that that has the potential of is, is a lot of energy savings. You can actually save a lot of energy by slowing down the water to just what you need. Um, you can maintain specific flow rates. Uh, we're talking Ricardo's project where the new fil you know, the clean filters, everything ran fine, but as the filter dirtied up, everything died down. This, this pump down here would actually sense that and speed up. So you might start at half speed, and as the filter got dirtier, the pump would just keep ramping up and ramping up. At some point, it's going to get up to blow up. <laughs> right. At some point, it gets up to 3450, and it just can't go any faster. And then you'll start to see things slow down. But that, you know, maybe that extends it a couple weeks before you got to change the filters. We're going to talk about the filters in a little bit. 
Um, when you slow things down, they get quieter, everything lasts longer, um, and the motors that are used are, are three-phase motors, which are more efficient uh, than, than, your, uh, than other motors. We've, we've used these on all motor sizes, you know, up to you know, 50 horsepower. You can use, get variable frequency drives for any, any size motor. This, this unit down here is actually a, a common pump in the pool industry. And what's happened is that the, 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 the expense of, of variable frequency drives has come way down. And now the, you know, the sales are coming up, so the price point is really tolerable for these smaller sized units. Um, you can actually buy this pump for like 1100 bucks, and it's got the variable frequency drive built right onto the pump, uh, which is really impressive. I mean, you, the, just the little boxes used to cost more than that, but you can get those things now for a couple hundred bucks. So it's really, and you can add that to existing, you know, three-phase motors that are out there. So uh, as you're redeveloping things, that's a great, great tool for um, uh, providing more control over the system. There was a, another project yesterday where somebody talked about, you know, when the toilet flushed, the water would, you know, squirt out further. Well, if that water was controlled by a, a, a pump like this, or a variable frequency drive, it, you could actually have a sensor that just monitored the pressure and just kept it at whatever you needed, whether somebody was flushing the toilet or not. The, the pressure would be constant. Um, so those are the kind of things that you can do with variable frequency technology. Filtration. Um, there's different products out there or different uh, methods or media for filtration. Um, we use a lot of sand for commercial projects. Um, I like it because I can automate the backwash. Um, you can clean the filter without having to take anything apart. You, in fact, I can do it electronically from an iPad if I wanted to um, by just putting a, a motor actuator on the backwash valve. Um, and they're, uh, especially for water features, the, the clarity of the water is, is great. In fact, I, I, some of the best water clarity I've ever seen is from a sand filter. Despite the, the stuff in the internet saying that it doesn't filter down as fine as, as DE or cartridge, I can make it work as good as DE or cartridge. Um, cartridge filtration. Um, <clears throat> Ricardo showed a photo of what that looked like. There, you've got a housing and there's, uh, you know, one or more cartridges in there and you take the cartridge out and clean it, put it back in, or you replace the cartridge. Um, and the problem with those is that it's very labor intensive. I would say for your project, what I would do is look at doing sand filtration and automating the backwash. And there's some rules about how fast that water should go through there, but I know you can handle the the goose feces with that system. In fact, the sand filters, that I, we still do uh, zoological projects, uh, done projects for SeaWorld and, and Shamu poops too, and this is how, <laughs> how we filter, right? <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's the only way to do it. You'd never want to do that with a cartridge filter. So it, it's just the wrong technology for that particular type of Do you need a bigger vessel for the sand? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you would need a bigger vessel, but it's uh, it's still the bigger vessel is what solves all the problems though, because I can keep all the debris right on the top of the filter and then just have it backwash out, and I don't have to get in there and do anything with it. So, so for a fountain the size of the one that we saw we had trouble with, with the Fountain of Life, uh, or the other, the Tyler Fountain, how big of would this be, and how do they have to? Maintain it. I mean, it, obviously, you do have to clean out the sand when. Where does this all go? <laughs> well, as what happens is the water, the debris actually comes in. It comes in the top of the filter and spills out. So imagine here's your dirty water coming down, and the debris starts collecting at the top of the sand, and your clean water comes out the bottom side. To backwash it, you're actually pushing water up through this way, and it, it takes all the debris and sends it out of the top and throws it away. So when you do that, you're, you're throwing away some of the water out of the pond, 
Um, or, you, or you could set it up to backwash with fresh water if you wanted to, so you wouldn't throw away any water. Where does it throw it? Into the sewer. Oh. Yeah. So you have a, a, a wasteland that yeah. you're backwashing into a wasteland. Like a sanitary sewer. Yeah, sanitary sewer. Right. Especially if there's used to it. When you were talking about skimmers and being able to skim off leaves, is that system going to even deal with that large floating, or is it going to get macerated at all in the process? Or? It will. Um, if you have leaves, though, I would say that you want a pump that's got a strainer in front of it, either an integral strainer or you, or you put a separate you know, strainer in front of the pump and try to catch some of the bigger debris, because you don't really want that going through the impeller of the pump anyway. Um, you could do an open impeller pump, and there are certainly pumps that handle uh, debris, you know, that handle up to like two inch diameter solids fairly easily, but uh, I, I would rather not send that stuff into the filter if I could catch it ahead of time with a strainer, I would do that. But uh, I think the story was that the, the goose stuff was just too slimy, it'll, it'll go through a strainer. And, and I, I understand that, I mean, we, the worst thing I've ever dealt with was hippos, actually. Because their, their waste is like, they always do it in the water, and it explodes, and it's like made out of grass, and, and everything just floats, and, it, and, it, and it, I just want to dump the whole pool and start all over it. I've never, never seen anything worse than a pit of pool. Uh, biological filtration is uh, using bead filters. This is what we would use on a, on a koi pond or some kind of fish system. Uh, Strainers, we just talked about that. Um, centrifugal filters are, um, what that is, is it, imagine if you had like a cone and you take water in tangentially into the cone and it's spinning around. The heavier debris is gonna fly out to the outside where you can actually take it out of the system and, and get rid of it. And the, the lighter stuff, which is hopefully just the water, comes out of the bottom and, and moves through the system. We've used that to separate sand from, you know, water, even before it even gets into the pump. It'll just, you know, automatically throw away the heavier debris. Um, so, you know, depending on, on what the application is, you have to select the right technology for, um, for treating that water. Chemical monitoring. Uh, this is an example of a chemical automation system. Everything, every project we do gets some kind of chemical automation on it. Uh, most of our projects, uh, you know, unless it's a fish system or something like that where you're, where you're not putting any chemicals in it. Um, the way to think about this is it's like a thermostat for your heater. You have, uh, in this case, we're, we're monitoring two different things, so there's two different probes, but one of them is uh, monitoring the ORP, the oxidation reduction potential of the water. And that's really an indirect measurement of the, uh, any oxidants in the water, like chlorine or ozone, bromine. Um, and you have a set point in here, and that's measured in millivolts. So you might set this to, let's say, 700 millivolts. And if the pool, or you know, whatever the body of water is, when it drops below that set point, this system powers up a pump. So one of these lines is powered in, one of them goes to a little, like a medical pump or something, a peristaltic pump, and it just injects chlorine until the, the set point is achieved, until you get back to 700. So just like a thermostat setting the temperature in the room. The other probe would measure the pH of the water. So if it's uh, something, you know, you, you don't want the pH to get too far away from from the ideal set point, uh, or it'll damage you know the materials. Um, so you just you set it. Uh, usually, if you're adding chlorine, what tends to happen is that your pH climbs, and the fix for that is to add acid. So you would have an acid feeder on here, and you would set your pH at say 7.2 to 7.4, which is the pH of your eyes. If the water pH matches the pH of your eyes, your eyes won't burn when you get in the water. Um, and then it just automatically feeds in a little liquid acid or something. And there's different things you can put here. I mean, you can have a ozone generator that kicks on or, or some other granular feeder for uh, you know, granular chlorine or something. Those probes, how much maintenance and calibration do they, do they require? 
Well, about every, uh, about, I would say about every two months you want to clean them. You want to take them out and do a cleaning on them. Uh, they only last about two years, and that kind of depends on, on some environmental things. You know, how much, you know, how, how bad is the water chemistry going through it all the time? Is it going through too fast and just wearing, you know, wearing out the, uh, glass the KCL in there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's actually a little pour. There's a chemical in there. So it's think of it like a battery. That I mean, that's really the best way to describe that. There's actually a chemical in there that that actually sort of has to leak out, and it's it's a reference chemical, and and the probe is comparing that reference to the actual water chemistry to determine what the, the chemical range is. So eventually, the the probe runs out of the KCO. Yeah. Is that two years with daily operation or? Is that a 24-month period, whereas you run it four months, four months, four months over probably you know, three or four years, but taking care of it in the off-season? Yeah, you could make it last longer if you're only running it for four months a year. You, you would you would want to take it out and then store right. it, it submerged in, in the KCL, which is what's really inside of it. Um, and they're not terribly expensive. I mean, they're 100 bucks or something for a program. How much for the system? In general, mm. there's a range. There's probably, I'd say they probably start at six hundred dollars and go up to a couple thousand bucks for one that talks to the internet and gives you, you know, records the data. A lot of hotels will use one that actually records the data internally because they, you know, they've had that experience where some guest calls them up on Monday and says, oh, I want my bill wiped out because I got sick in your spa. And then they go print out the report and go, no, water was good. I'm keeping your money. <laughs> so they, uh, they spend a little more for the system. So the Internet ones are ones that can actually be controlled remotely. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can monitor them uh, remotely and um, even feed chemicals remotely. Is there another question back there? Talked a little bit about uh, UV yesterday. I won't go into too much detail, but this is just an example of a system where you've got water flowing in one side and flowing out the other side, and it flows past a UV lamp that uh, inactivates any uh, you know, bacteria in there. Question? Yeah. You inject your chemicals after your UV? Uh, yes. If you're having acid or water Yeah, yeah, usually I do um, because UV destroys chlorine. Uh, now they say that in the, in the short time that the water's flowing through there, it's not supposed to be a problem, but still I, I like to have it after that, have the chemicals injected after that. Uh, ozone, I'm a, I'm a big fan of ozone. This really came from my experience with the water park uh, the zoos, uh, the SeaWorld uh, type clients out there, because they can't use chlorine. You can't put chlorine in, in Shamu's tank. Uh, it's a priceless animal. So uh, what we do instead is we inject ozone into the water, and in high concentrations, that ozone just nukes the water. I mean, er every pathogen is, is killed. And... Um, the, as it reacts, the ozone reverts very quickly back to oxygen, and you can strip off that oxygen and strip off any uh, excess ozone and run it through a destruct unit. I think I have a schematic diagram. Um, in this case, we're showing that we're using a pump, and then we're injecting the ozone in, and we're actually running it through this contact tank. Um, and the goal of the tank is to uh, achieve a certain CT value. It's a, a concentration multiplied by the time that it's in there. So the concentration comes from how much ozone you're injecting relative to the flow rate. And then the time, of course, you know, is related to how big that vessel is. And certain CT values are known to kill off uh, certain pathogens, uh, like Giardia and, and other you know, recreational water illnesses, that there are certain CT values that the EPA has said, hey, this CT value will, will kill that. So, and then by doing this, what ends up ha happening is you get this water that's, that's been 
nuked, if you will, and any excess ozone comes off of there. So hopefully what's going out into the vessel does not have any free ozone that you're going to smell. Nothing out in the, uh, in the vessel. I think for you guys, this contact tank is really important because I actually would not want the ozone. It, ozone's a very strong oxidant. I wouldn't want it near any statues or plants or anything like that because it, it, it can damage these. Yeah. Um, so this works similarly to the, uh, the UVC where it's only effective if, if whatever you're trying to kill is actually flowing through the water. If it's attached to the, you know, the wall of the, the fountain or whatever, it's not going to do anything because it can't reach it. Right, right. Now, that being said, I, we've actually done systems that are chlorine free and they just run on ozone and you can't smell the ozone, you can't, but you can detect it in the water. Normally with, with ozone, you would want to maintain a residual of, of chlorine in the water. Now you could reduce that instead of having two parts per million chlorine, you could be down at a half a part, which would be much better for you uh, because you're going to let the ozone do all the work back in the filtration system. And assuming that you've designed that correctly and your system's efficient, th this will handle it. Um, What's you know, the frequency of the injection? It's continuous. Yeah, the ozone generator, um, because the half-life is, is measured in seconds, it, it, you have to generate it on site. You can't produce ozone and then truck it somewhere, like, like you know, in a bottle. You, you generate it right on site. Um, one way is with the UV systems. I prefer the corona discharge. The concentration's a little higher, and, and I think the systems are, that last a lot longer uh, with, with proper maintenance. Uh, yeah. Um, can you describe a little bit how the trap works, the ozone trap? The ozone trap. Um, you have in your dry ozone destruction. Oh, the, yeah, on this side here. Okay. There's the ozone destruct unit um, is really just a, like a bed of, of granular activated carbon, and as soon as ozone hits it, it just turns right back to oxygen. Um, Inside there, uh, now there may be moisture coming up through there because it, the ozone just left the water and there may be water that, that gets up into the system. So there's usually a little heater in there to keep the, the carbon dry. And to make sure that we don't get any water up there, we have this water trap detail. And actually the, the manufacturers basically have it down to a little part that you buy now and you just plumb it in. And what it does is it ensures that if any water got up into the system, it would actually fall out and go through a drain as opposed to going up into the unit where you've got the carbon. So that guarantees that you're not going to have an issue with the uh, off-gas destruction. And what maintenance is required then? Nothing. There's, there's no maintenance on, on these systems. Every few years you may have to change the, the carbon in that yes, system, but there's no, no regular maintenance for that. The maintenance for the ozone generator is every few months you want to uh, clean things up. Uh, some companies say once a year you actually want to dismantle the, uh, the corona discharge cells and, and clean them out and, and reassemble them. It's basically a, a chamber of lightning, if you will. That's how they create it is with a uh, dielectric and they just create lightning in a tube. And if, if, if there's a failure, a mechanical failure, you know, how do you know that that's happening? There, on the ozone generator, there are, you know, depending on the model, of course, but there are indicator lights that, that tell you, you know, this has got power. And, and you can use ozone monitoring devices. You, you could use the ORP sensors that we were talking about, will tell you if, if it's actually working. Um, when we put these in enclosed rooms, if, if we have a lot of ozone, we'll actually put in a little wall mounted air quality monitoring thing that just sniffs for ozone like a like a smoke detector would and it alarms if, if the uh, if it detects ozone in there just in case you had a, a leaking tube or something because you wouldn't want to breathe it you, you've all smelled the ozone before if you've ever been into like a fedex kinkos and they've got all the copiers going every time those copiers flash they're creating ozone so you ever walk in and kind of get that sweet pungent smell of the copiers running that's ozone but in those concentrations, you know, you'll see actually on, on some of the bigger copiers, like a tube going up to the ceiling because they're trying to vent it off. 
So you're breathing it all day. Yeah. Am I, uh, on the ozone, uh, the destruct unit. Now, is that does that have to be vented off, or can that be? Is that just vent into a room? Um, that yeah, that could be vented off. We usually vent it outside of the room, but the only thing coming out of there is just air. Air. Yeah, there's no there's no more ozone at that point. One thing I've seen on uh, particularly on indoor fountains and thinking of uh, often the, the plumbing is done in such a way is that you actually get terrible water circulation. You get a single stand pipe which is the return line, mm -hmm. and you get very little mixing of the water within the, within the basin. And you get dead zones where, you know, the question of having to get the return water, uh, or the water in the basin well mixed, to be able to return things like bacteria, dirt, sludge, mm -hmm. it, it's often that the, the plumbing design on the return line doesn't uh, accommodate a good uh, circulation within the bowl. And so you get this, this you're, I always get the sense that you're cleaning the same water again and again. Mm -hmm. It's just right yeah. at the surface. This is some short circuiting. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that is a problem. And it's important, you know, to, to try to design those, those issues out. I actually just ran out of time, so I'm going to run through the rest of these pretty quick. Uh, salt systems, you've heard of salt. It's really a way to make chlorine in the pool. I do not recommend doing this anywhere. <laughs> the salt will uh, destroy everything eventually. Uh, descalers, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. On the magnets, I, the reason I was asking about it is that I had a client that uh, had a little scum line on, on his, on his uh, pool. And he bought some of those magnets. The scum line was there for years. It was like calcium. He bought some of those magnets, clamped it around the pipes in the equipment area. And in less than four weeks, the scum line disappeared. And I was like, man, that really worked. And it was just magnets. <laughs> and then there's electronic versions of that. But I just, that, that's the only experience I know. And I was just wondering if, if anyone here knew anything about it. Uh, ionizers, copper and silver. Uh, the problem with, with those, I think, is staining. I don't, I don't recommend those. Uh, there's also a lot of products in the uh, industry. I just, I generally call it magic pixie dust. Everyone has their secret formula and they say, oh, you know, you put this in and it'll solve all your problem and you won't need chlorine anymore. The problem is, is it doesn't work. <laughs> none of it, none of it works nearly as good as, as chlorine. They all raise the, the total dissolved solids, which I think is, is bad. It's one thing that's so great about the ozone is that the byproduct is oxygen, right? So it, it keeps the TDS low. Ozone is pH neutral, so you're not having to add a bunch of acid with it. So um, automatic fill devices. Um, with hard water, uh, what we've been doing is putting in RO systems. And we never fill the pool with that, because uh, it'll just etch the materials. But uh, fill the, the system with good water. And then we have the option to basically bypass the regular fill and, and run water through the RO. You might do that for a month and then run your testing and kind of see where you're at with your hardness and, and TDS. And then you can switch the valves back and shut off the RO. And, you know, by just checking it, you know, on a monthly basis for the amount of water that's used for, for you know, a lot of vessels, it, it actually works out pretty good. And it keeps things in check so you don't have to throw away a bunch of water. Uh, General control systems. This is just controllers that schedule, you know, lighting and the pumps and all that stuff. These have gotten a lot more advanced. Uh, the, the communication uh, technology has gotten a lot better over the last uh, five years or so. Uh, so that you can, you can monitor these things remotely from your iPad or whatever. Uh, you can have multiple bodies of water monitor all at your, your desktop so you can see what's going on out there. Um, We've got a project in the Bahamas where we actually have uh, we actually have cameras, and sometimes we actually have to look at the cameras to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, quick project, I'll I'll uh, run through a few photos. This this was a, uh, a water feature in uh, Montecito in the, in Santa Barbara. Uh, it was built in the uh, about 1915 or so. Um, 
And originally, the water flowed through this. It was fed from a natural waterfall, and there was no recirculation system. The water started at the, at the far end. There's spillways on, on either side, actually three on, on those walls in the far back. Um, and the water came out of those spillways, and then it flowed through each of these little runnels and spilled out of the mouths of each of the different characters. Um, the system actually did not run since the 70s because the maintenance was a disaster. Every, um, every little spillway uh, would just clog up with debris. There's a lot of oak trees here, and so within an hour of operation, leaves would fall in and just jam up the small hole on the back side of the wall behind the line of path there. And it, once it plugged up, then the basin would just overflow and then that would cause damage to the landscape. And so they, they just hadn't been using it. Um, and so our, our challenge here was to find a way to, to get this to work with a recirculating system. The waterfall has dried up um, years ago. So, and, and this property is owned by a, an elderly couple that didn't want the maintenance nightmare. I think when this was originally built, this estate probably had full-time staff, so they, uh, they could afford to have somebody out there cleaning it up all the time. And what we did is we actually uh, found a way to, we put in a, a, a tank underground and multiple pumps, and we pulled out of the tank, and we fed each of those mounds independently with clean filtered water. And then we had a skimmer, uh, basically a custom bronze piece that I designed, uh, which really just had a little slot. So as this water would fall over, it would just overflow here, and all that water would flow by gravity back to the tank. So each system was sort of its own independent little uh, vessel, but all shared a common tank, uh, a single set of uh, uh, filtration and chemical treatment systems. And we were able to adjust the flows going to each different vessel. So one of the problems here, you can see the staining on that back wall. They had such a little trickle back there that the water would just suck back to the wall and, and just dribble down the wall. Now we were able to actually get it to sheet off and, and um, they did some cleanup on that wall and a little bit of restoration. But um, hopefully this will last a lot longer uh, before it destroys that wall. Where this, is that wall? Uh, that wall was back up here. That's, that's really the start of it. Uh -huh. And uh, this is really the termination here. Now, in rea it, when this was originally done, once the water hit this point, it actually went underground under the house. And there's another series of features on the downhill side of, of the estate. And it all terminates into an underground grotto that you can go and sit in and it's, uh, it's got like this cooling effect. It's really, really kind of neat. But the water just flowed through and once it went into the grotto, it, it went out basically to a storm drain and, and flowed out to the ocean. So on your, on your new design, when, you shut, when it shuts off, it doesn't overflow your bottom pool there, just... Right, right. And stops. any debris that gets in there actually flows through these little bronze skimmers that we designed. And here's one. Uh, I never wanted to do the pile, but um, there were other issues with the vessels because there, there was a lot of structural issues and cracking, and so we had a lot of waterproofing details to work out, and we couldn't touch the outsides because that was all, you know, original finished material. So the only solution was to put a uh, system to the inside, and to hide that, we ended up with this uh, pile that the architect selected. But here's you know clean filtered water coming in and all, everything, including the leaves, just falls into there and we catch the leaves in that tank. So it really makes all of this maintenance free. All the maintenance is just done at the uh, where the tank is. And you can open a lid, pull out a basket and dump out the leaves and uh, the weekly um, pool and, and water feature maintenance guy can handle all of that. So how long has this been in operation since you did the uh, this has now been running for four years. How is it now? Have you seen it recently? Or? Yeah, it's running fine. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Yeah, because we're only putting clean water up there, it's... Uh, Where do you clean it out? There, I did show a picture of it, but there's there's a an area down the hill a little bit where there's a, a, a tank 
buried underground where all the water flows to, and all the equipment sits on top of the tank. This might have that code section on the, yeah, here it is. Article 680.26B1B, that was that uh, equi equipotential bonding code requirement. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. More questions for David? Were there any back? Oh, yes. What, what, what estate was that in Ponceo? Uh, it's called Kingston Oaks. I just live there. Yeah. Were there questions over here? I thought there had been a question. Or, yeah, uh, I have Tom? a quick question. You know, on the variable drive pumps, so you could <laughs> adjust the speed of the motor to put out a certain amount of water. And pumps have to run in what they call the sweet spot so that there's some back pressure against the impeller to make everything run right. So do you still have a valve on the outflow that you can adjust to put enough back pressure against the pump? So I'm just curious how it's going. Yeah, it, we'll usually have a valve there because you may need to isolate the pump anyway. And if the, if sure, the pump right. is probably in a vault of some sort, you want a flooded suction for it. So we probably would have a, 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 a valve there. But our goal is to not throttle the valves because when you throttle a valve, you're just wasting energy. You're, you're creating head and restricting the flow, and the pump is trying to overcome that. But with the variable speed drives, it, the way that the variable frequency drives controls the power, you, you don't have that problem where you need to throttle a valve. It actually accounts for that when it's, it's not just changing the frequency, it's changing every, you know, the, the power driven to that motor. So mm -hmm. it, it'll actually handle it, you know, when you slow it down, it's, you have a new sweet spot for the pump is what happens. Your, okay. your pump curves, I actually have one. I threw it in there. I, I would, never intended to talk about it, but I thought somebody may bring this up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is actually a series of different horsepower pumps, but you could take this pump right here and slow it down and essentially replicate all of these versions here. You could take the three horse and slow it down and get the performance of the half horse. So if the sweet spot is, is here at full speed, you know, it, you've got a different sweet spot when you slow it down. Rather than using a valve to throttle against it to slow right. it down. Right. Yeah, I see. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's why, you know, what happens with the valve is that you're you're, you're operating at the wrong spot and, and you have to, you may be operating off the end of the curve and you're throttling the valve to bring your, right. your, your system curve in line with the sweet spot of the pump. And what, what I would rather do is just slow the pump down until you were at that spot. Yeah, now that gets, yeah, a, it's yeah. tricky to try to explain this in such a short time. I do this in a two day class where you'll really get, get it. But I think you explained it just right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop now. <laughs> well, for, for those of my colleagues here that have ever seen our recirculating wind tunnel, our variable speed band is identical to this. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we do to control the wind speed in that environmental exposure chamber is exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Uh,